I'd like to call to order the March 25th, 2019 meeting of the Highland Park Board of Education. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act, the Highland Park Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting setting forth the time, date, and location to be submitted for publication to the Home News Tribune and Star Ledger and posted on the board's website at least 48 hours in advance of this meeting. Members of the public who wish to address the board will be given the opportunity to do so before the board adjourns for the ev evening. Linda, can we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Here. Ms. Simarusti? Here. Ms. Coleman? Ms. Gowan? Mr. Krieger? Here. Mr. Magaziner? Here. Ms. McFadden Di Nicola? Here. Mr. Roslevich? Mr. Whitten? Whiten? Be it resolved, pursuant to the Sunshine Act and JSA 10 4 12 and 13, the Highland Park Board of Education will now meet in closed session to discuss discipline and HIV matters. These exemptions are permitted to be discussed in closed session in accordance with NJSA 10 4 13. Information regarding the Board's closed session discussion will be disclosed to the public as soon as the need for confidentiality no longer exists. Can I get a motion to recess to closed session? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Closed session? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. If we could please uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Flags right over there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, Linda, we don't have any communications on the agenda. Is there anything since we put the agenda out? I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, and then number eight on the agenda, we have corrections to the minutes from the January 28th, 2019 meeting. Um, and number, n number nine, then we also have the approval of the minutes from the regular public and executive session meetings from February 25th, 2019. Um, would somebody like to move items uh, eight and nine? Yes, I would like to move items eight and nine. <laughs> uh, uh, is there a second? Second. second. Is there any discussion on either of those two items? No. 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 Seeing none. Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Abstain. Ms. McFadden to Nicola? Yes. Okay, uh, student representative report. We have a singular student this evening. Yes, I wasn't able to make it today. All right. So for Bartle, um, or Irving, there's not much news from Irving since last week. Uh, for Bartle, uh, Bartle's having an awards assembly and a book club meeting on the 27th. For the middle school, uh, the middle school had its open wash, open hearts Thursdays last week. And tomorrow there will be a half day for parent-teacher conferences. For the high school, parent-teacher conferences were last week. The Model Congress team is preparing for Rutgers Model Congress conference last week. Uh, and we wish them the best of luck. We're in the process of being recertified for bronze certification for Sustainable Jersey for the school district. Uh, global citizenship students have finished their research and are preparing for their final project. Uh, we have a special request to submit a survey to the high school student body from members of Teen Pep. They need the permission of the board as well as uh, certain other processes before going ahead with the survey, which I have all shared with you. Uh, Teen PEP stands for Teen Prevention Education Program. This is a group com comprised of juniors and seniors that have been educated in leadership and sexuality issues and help educate other underclassmen. Playing a major role in the education of the freshmen about uh, important sex-related topics, Teen PEP believes it would be in the best interest of not only the school but more importantly to the students by granting them access to basic contraception. According to Planned Parenthood, among teen females aged 15 to 19, 42% reported being sexually active, and among teen males, this was 44%. Understanding this statistic, it's important to encourage and support condom use among young teens because it is designed to aid in preventing HIV and AIDS, STDs, and unwanted pregnancy. 
uh, Teen Pep is looking for funding for this program, which would be uh, discreetly distributing uh, condoms and other uh, forms of contraception in the nurse's office. Awesome. So you're going to look into what we can do to distribute that survey? Yep. Okay. Can uh, I ask a quick question? What it, it said that there's already been responses, so does that mean it's already been partly administered or like when you go to, I just want to ensure like is this a survey that's already been completed or a survey that's? No, this hasn't been completed. Um, we weren't aware that we needed to seek parent approval before we administered oh, the oh, survey. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. So, so. Um, we've, it's currently closed before we got it. Uh, going to go ahead with it again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, move on to Dr. Taylor's report. I'm very uh, excited to see familiar faces, including one of our uh, own uh, teachers, middle school teachers, who happens to also have a family um, here in town. I'd like to introduce Mr. Benjamin, um, who will go to the podium and speak a few words about a special person who's here to be honored. <laughs> Good evening, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Taylor, guests, and members of the Highland Park community who are watching this meeting remotely. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here tonight on this special occasion to continue with a great tradition the Board has established, which is to continuously acknowledge students of excellence and reward such students with the distinction of being recognized as the Board of Education Student of the Month. Francis of Assisi said, Start by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Each day we live our lives doing what's necessary, and if time permits, and we have a little bit more energy in our day, we sometimes do what's possible. When and where do we learn to do the impossible? I'd say that learning to do the impossible starts in our youth. In our youth, we are fearless. We stretch our limits and imagination and never hesitate to ask ourselves and others, why or why not? Our Bardo community has and continues to flourish, not just because we have an extremely dedicated, creative, and instructionally talented staff, but also because of our incredible student body. Since coming to Bardo nearly five years ago, I have been truly blessed to meet some amazing and inspiring students who do near impossible things. With the over 50 events, initiatives, programs, and activities we provide students and families throughout the school year, it's hard to imagine that even a fraction of these events, initiatives, programs, and activities are engaged with fidelity, but we do it. We are able to accomplish the impossible through dedicated, creative, and instructionally talented staff and amazing and inspiring student leaders. Tonight, I'm happy and I'm proud to be here acknowledging Bartles Board of Education Student of the Month Award. I'm proud to look into the eyes of some pretty dedicated, caring, and inspiring parents and say, your child is amazing and truly inspiring. She is who she is because of you. On occasion, I've actually had the opportunity to, to, to speak to Dan and talk to Dan um, just about parenting in general, as a new parent myself, and as a soon-to-be uh, another one on the way, and he's given some really sound advice, and I'm very appreciative of it, and by the looks of it, how you're raising your children, you know, I'm going to take a lot of the advice you've given over the years, so thank you for that. I met our Board of Education Student of the Month when she arrived as a second grader, and I can tell you, it is not a surprise that she has turned out to be the student leader she is today, now as a fifth grader. Our Board of Education Student of the Month personifies many leadership qualities many would find rare in many of our youth today. Our Board of Education Student of the Month is like all of the students, and she loves to laugh and have fun with her friends. However, she goes a step further when engaging peers and teachers. She is honest, has integrity, confident, inspires others, 
has commitment and passion, is a good communicator, makes great decisions, is accountable, creative, and most importantly, shows empathy. In addition to being a great student and student leader, our student of the month is an integral member of our Bartle family and community. She volunteers her broadcasting skills for our morning BTV announcements. She volunteers countless hours to assist our media specialists in organizing the library. She volunteers and assists with cleaning up after an epic event. She has even baked food to assist in our fundraising efforts for class trips and so many other noteworthy causes. Such a true inspiration. And wait until you see her smile, it lights up the room. I cannot imagine a more worthy recipient of our Bartle Board of Education Student of the Month Award than this individual. Please welcome me in acknowledging and congratulating Jahan Miladnik on being a great student and human being and receiving the Highland Park Board of Education Student of the Month Award. Again, thank you board members and congratulations, Jahan. Come on up here. So I'm going to shift gears. Uh, I'd like to um, speak for about 15 minutes about a, present, a, uh, a workshop I had a chance to attend in Atlanta. Give me one second. I'm going to set up my computer. Do my thing. Dan and Rob, you guys could come over here to this corner. And you still have microphones if you want. Ah, perfect. So I have to thank the board and um, the community directly for supporting my participation in a wonderful conference called the REACH Conference that was held in Atlanta. Um, REACH, by the way, stands for this. The REACH organization is um, solely purpose to uh, bring together um, well-known speakers and researchers to focus on equity, educational equity. So my intent in going down to Atlanta was to um, focus specifically on the topics that we have been addressing through our strategic plan, including discipline equity, um, how to work with students in poverty, our lower socioeconomic student population, how to Hey, John, can we turn the volume down a little bit? I'm getting some feedback. Sorry. Thanks. Um, and how to help the students who are disenfranchised have a greater voice. So I'd like to spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes talking about what I learned and what I'll be turning to the leadership team. Thank you. Um, so the conference took place for two days back in February, a little over a month ago. Uh, the first keynote speaker was a real kick, 
poet Nikki Giovanni, who some of us know. Um, if you don't, I definitely would look for her work. She was a smash, uh, a good way to warm everybody up. Participants of the conference were from all over the country, uh, mostly counselors, some teachers, a lot of leaders, principals, one or two superintendents. I was one of the very few superintendents who were there, uh, and then some higher education folks. One of the first workshops I attended um, was facilitated by the author of this work, Integrating Camelot. The woman on the right, actually a Teachers College grad, she and I had classes together, it turns out, when I was doing my doctoral work at Teachers College, um, was a city worker for the New York City school system and talked about the fight to um, integrate her, a mostly black student school uh, situated in one of the worst parts of the Bronx. And, um, and so what we did is we, we dissected her book, uh, at least a piece of it, and looked at it as a case study, and then examined some of the, um, the keys to her success to finally integrating the faculty first and then the students little by little. I mean, as we all know right now, New York City is dealing with um, a, a host of issues regarding integration, particularly with its specialized schools like Stuyvesant and Brooklyn Tech. I'm going to share some of my takeaways with you in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the uh, things that I, I, I really came away thinking mostly about when I stepped out of that workshop was the need for us to be giving people in our schools, whether they're adults, parents, guardians, caretakers of our kids, or kids themselves, especially in the upper grades, a voice. And by voice, I'm not talking about a seat at the table, desk that helps. I'm actually talking about an opportunity to be expressive, uh, to know that they have a, a place where they could go um, comfortably, safely, and talk about their needs. Um, I love the phrase that I took away from um, the author's workshop, that we've got to focus on figuring out how to transform people's view about the importance of giving voice. There are people working in our school district, including me to a certain extent, who don't realize just how important it is focusing on giving other people voice. Another workshop I attended, um, which reflected some of the stuff we're already doing, had to do with implicit bias. The gentleman on the right works with the National Training Institute on Race and Equity, and uh, took us through a, a, a whole two-day series of workshops regarding implicit bias. Here's some interesting takeaways. Um, he emphasized the point that so much of, of what we do is done subconsciously. We don't even realize how we may treat other people, how we might uh, make decisions, how we interact with people like kids on a level that we just don't consciously, we're not, of which we're not consciously aware. Um, if, if anything, this, this, this validated some of what we're starting to do, or what we, we started to do, and what we're continuing to do in our professional learning communities, and that is to try to uncover our implicit biases and then realize how they're imp impacting our relationships, how they're leading to microaggressions in some cases. And then there's a gentleman who I am desperate to bring to Highland Park, whose name is Chris Emden. Um, Chris is a teacher's college professor, about 45 minutes from here, a, um, uh, the author, uh, one of the books that I've read of his, that uh, is probably one of the more popular is For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood, Y'all. Um, and, and I'll explain how that all plays into what he has to say. It's not so much, by the way, that what he says in his book and what he said to us in his keynote um, was brand new. It was just his delivery. Um, I, I'm working with my partners at Rutgers University, including Ben Justice, uh, Nora Highland, who's the head of the teaching certification program, to see if we can come together as a triad with our district, Rutgers, two departments, to try to fund his appearance in September. So, so that's, that's my head right now. I'd love to have him help rile up our troops. I love the focus of his thinking. Chris is all about getting past this notion that achievement's only academic. That, you know, you have to see achievement in, and I know I'm speaking to the choir somewhat with our Board of Education, that achievement is strictly by the numbers on a proficiency assessment. If I could somehow get the State Board of Education to realize this and scrap its graduation assessment plans, even if it means getting Chris Enton down to Trenton, I would. 
he talks about how we've just got to get kids to think about what it feels like to be excellent, to be so, so, so strong academically, socially, and emotionally. You know, fortunately, there's no clear measure of that. We can't, you know, we can anecdotally um, determine if a kid's feeling excellent, but we really can't measure it, which is probably why policymakers have such a hard time with what Chris is trying to say. But just imagine if we could eschew the notion that kids um, only are academically excellent if we can measure that excellence. What about if we just got them to feel excellent? And he talked a lot about doing these things to get them to feel excellent, to give them affirmation, especially our disenfranchised kids, our students of color, our Hispanic students, not all, but many, our students in low socioeconomic stratas. These are the kids who we have to give a little extra to so they feel affirmed that they are already good and that we can make them feel excellent if we just keep supporting them. That's why I'm so bent on doing whatever we can to focus on our social emotional wellness initiatives. We have a long way to go in you know, the big picture arena, especially with the, in the area of discipline. But what if we just looked at how we can affirm what our kids are about while they're in the classroom? Here's a, I'm, I'm hoping my audio picks this up. Somebody asked a question that I was, I was gonna ask Chris. I, the, the question was, <clears throat> what do you do with the educator, the adult in the school who doesn't get that, who doesn't realize that um, the way he or she thinks subconsciously might be negatively impacting kids' potential to feel excellent. And this was his answer, and I'm hoping like, you can hear it, and if you can, I'll come back to it and try to make it louder. Okay, you can't hear it, so hold on. I want to turn back to it, so. Hang in there. All right, you have to listen carefully. Never let that expression be the ending of the dialogue. And that's exactly what this gets up. And depending on the response to this approach, so if it's, I realize how much I wrong young people, it's like, well, let's work together and do it right if it's like, maybe you uh, now I'm still you're a bad actor, right? Then you can. <laughs> then you can. 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 You know, this is no, I should love for those two months, right? For a couple of reasons. It depends on how far you are. Are you running out of school building? Fine. Are you running out of school building? I didn't say that. If you run away, like, I quit. Fine. Sorry. If it's running because I don't know how to face it, you can say, I understand how you feel like this is so much more to run away from. And the thing with teachers is always this. Now let's work on your pedigree to make you better. And so I didn't get into all that today, but it is the perfect time to call. Oh, where's the book right now? This book. Y'all have to have that. Well, that's good. Who don't got it? That's good. Look, look, look. I'm just an improper. How many of you got any students? I got four and a half and a half and a half and a half. So, but you should get it. And, and, and I always have to go get into a bigger just that. And the reason why I say that is not because it's my book, but because I was very deliberate in the text about practice. All of this I've done today, it leads you to the emotion. Your only solution to deal with your emotions is what life is next. And what, what I try to do is look at it okay now, and you can go down. And you can have to do a lot of things, how you can construct the way forward. You can let them do the question. So, like, it's it almost like, what do you have to do? If you leave with the approach of teaching and learning, that becomes a negative for you. You know what I'm saying? So if you run and run away, wow. Uh, if you run and stay, that's what we're teaching. Teaching is, but teaching is healing. Not just for the kids, but the teacher. If you teach well, that's healing. Anybody that had that feeling before or not? Oh, yeah. Whoever, whoever had that like a lesson in your life, this is what I 
Yeah, and you know what he talks about uh, later? He, you know, he says, hey, the, the key to actually having that magical lesson is to relate to the kids. It comes back to relating to the kids, to getting down to them, to getting to where they, they're thinking, where their head is. So if you're teaching in the hood, you know, Chris will say, you got to relate to them in the hood. If you're teaching in an affluent suburb, I guess you got to relate to them as you would in an affluent suburb. But he says that's the key. It's about relating to your kids and matching their personality, their needs, getting there so you hit them. You hit them on some intimate level. The last workshop I attended, <clears throat> each workshop was about three to four hours, so we only got to three or four of them, was all about this, understanding how to work with kids um, who are in poverty. And this was probably where my biggest learning curve was, and I overcame it somewhat. Check out some of these facts about kids, about poverty in general, but think of kids living in poverty. Love the first fact, the first point, that the facilitator made a point to say, hey, you know, politicians on the left, politicians on the right, Democrats, Republicans, whatever you are, they all have different opinions, but when it comes down to it, you've got to think about poverty holistically. You have to think of it not as a political thing, but as a real thing that, for, with, with, with which a lot of data will speak to, to, to try to solve. Um, talked a lot about how when you look at the research, and the individual who, who ran this workshop, by the way, um, Ruby Kane, this is her sole work. This is what she does. I think she's based in Tennessee. Um, so they flew her in. This is all she does. She spends a lot of time collecting quantitative and quali qualitative data about poverty. And she talks about, according to her research, the, the most important thing that you can do for somebody in poverty, whether it's a child, a guardian, a parent, is to make sure that those folks connect with other people who could help them along. Because what she says is, through her research, who we know is what we know according to the poverty-stricken individuals. And it's like, it's, I guess it's like that with everybody, right? It's, like, it's not just a networking thing. It's a, who we know who can answer my question. Who, we, who do I know who can give me a little lift if I need it, a little inspiration. Who do I know if I need to borrow some money? You know, a bank, uh, a credit card company. It's, it's the, the who we know, by the way, is not just individuals. It could be institutions, it could be organizations. Unfortunately, people in poverty don't have those connections. They don't necessarily have the who's or the what's. And then, of course, she made a point to distinguish between generational poverty and situational poverty. The first, and I think it's the pretty you know, um, implicit ideas. First being generational poverty. It's one generation after the other that makes it extremely difficult to break. That's a cycle that's really, really hard to break. It's important for educators to know whether the child we have in our classroom is coming out of generational poverty or situational poverty, because then we have to change the way we support that child. Situational poverty could be a sudden circumstance. I know of one particular family currently homeless. Um, I know the background of the family. I know that's situational. It's something that they're dealing with right now for whatever reason. Lost a job, lost a home. The other, um, the other things that I'd like to share, turnkey to you um, also have to do with the, the facts behind um, poverty and how they may influence the way we work with students in poverty. Um, this is really interesting. Um, Dr. Payne classified the, the different rules that different socioeconomic classes um, live with, live by. Now, a lot of us are in the middle class here in this room. So these are the things that dictate what we do, our work, how we do well in work or with family, our material security. Do we have a job long term? Do we have a mortgage we can pay monthly? Look at what poverty, poverty's rules are. It's all about survival. It's about relationships, making sure that, that there's some family tethered to, to, it, to each other. 
um, and entertainment she was referring to in this case, just day by day, um, making sure that people, that the family, the people in the, in the, in the immediate surroundings are positive or thinking positive or are somewhat happy despite the circumstances. A couple of other interesting facts. Check this out. One good adult, a teacher, a principal, a supervisor, a paraprofessional can make the biggest difference in the success of a poverty-stricken child. That's heavy. And I also found these statistics to be a particular note. Look at the way the words we use change depending upon the people with whom we're speaking. What you're looking at, by the way, are in the second and uh, the second to last and the last um, columns on the right, the number of words that are affirming versus the number of words that are not affirming. They, what she refers to as discounts, they're, they're demerits, they're takeaways. I mean, if you really buy into this data, it should make us reflect on the words we use when we interact with kids in our classroom depending on their socioeconomic status. We should be mindful that we may be, especially with those kids in the low SES uh, strata, be using many more discounts than we are affirmations when we're talking to them. And finally, I thought this was interesting, um, that Dr. Payne talked about the need to uh, rely on your, um, your, your gut instinct, your gut reaction to things, your, your impulse to survive. Um, she didn't explain why necessarily, um, but she pointed out that's a, that's a reality for, for those who are poverty stricken. Um, I want to sit at my area. I'm going to shut the projector off and just read a few other takeaways on a list of my notes that I took and also get out of the feedback loop. So Darcy, if you want to return, you can. And then I'll take any questions anybody has. There's just a couple of other points. Um, we talked at this conference as a group and sometimes in group, small group discussions about the need for um, systems to be put in place to fight segregation since there is, there is relatively little a district leader like me can do on his or her own to affect holistic change. And you know, we've talked about this as a board, the need to build in systems, whether it's to, to work through discipline problems or um, to desegregate our segregated classes and some of our track classes. Um, <laughs> one thing Chris said, here's a takeaway quote I want to share. He said, uh, quote, school reform looks like freedom. And he talked about the pedagogy of freedom. Anyway, um, I've got you know, lots of notes. I took them as they came. I texted Monique uh, a few times from the conference. Monique is our chair of uh, equity and excellence because I was just so inspired. I really appreciate, again, the board giving me the opportunity to, to be in Atlanta with my peers. So thank you for everybody, uh, for everybody's support. Other questions, comments? So um, it sounded like it was a really great conference. Um, the thing that struck me, though, was the, um, I guess, lack of understanding that, yes, one wonderful teacher can make a difference, but that poverty is not uh, necessarily something that can be solved by um, education. For me, that's a really big one because um, it's personal. Um, I don't want to get into all of the details, but, but um, for 99% of the very smart people that I grew up with, not many of them were able to work their way out of um, difficult situations, financial situations. So. I think that there is um, more there anyway. I mean, I, I feel like what this conference presented sounded like it was going in the right direction, but that it was um,
perhaps I didn't pick up on it, but it, it's a much bigger, um, bigger issue and that I feel sometimes that we put a lot of pressure on individual educators to be, you know, like the, the magical magicians um, that these kids, <laughs> you know, will talk about in their, um, you know, their speeches when they're graduating from college or whatever. But I just, I really feel like it's, um, it's important for us to just think about that because um, for lots of people, it really doesn't matter. Um, and it's, it's hard to really like wrap your head and your heart around that. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but I do want to be cautious about how much pressure we put on educators. Right. No, right? I, I totally hear what you're saying. It, it's difficult to talk about. It, no, 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 but it's really important to look at the systemic barriers as well, which is, I think, what you're yes, getting at, so. is that, you know, it's not fair to put on the you know, teacher, like, okay, you're going to be the one who gets Johnny out of that generational poverty. Same you know, teacher. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I went to a, a education town hall last weekend, and one of the questions that was asked of the people who were there was, like, can you name that one teacher who was really inspirational to you? And one of the, one of the, person, one of the people who responded to that question didn't give a name of that one amazing teacher, and it was like they had done something horrible, yeah. that they couldn't come up with that like one amazing teacher. But that's, that's a lot of pressure to put on either person, right? Like either on the teacher or on the kid who's coming up through a system that, you know, there's, there's gonna be some savior there that's gonna Listen, you know, pull you out of Listen, it makes for a really good movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a great, you know, feel good story, but you know, it's, we've gotta work on things. Systems. As systems, right, exactly. So I would just, oh. oh. No, you go. I, I was just going to add that I think I agree with everything. I think this particular conference, though, and conferences like these are really like pep rallies in a sense for yeah. teachers who, as Michael uh, Chris Emden's book talks about, white teachers in the hood who need to get that sort of like, yeah, I know why I'm in this. I'm making a difference. I, maybe they did talk about systematic um, levels of uh, engagement here that affects all the students, but I think the purpose with these sort of conferences is to look at this singular component, right? The one component we do as educators have control over. Yeah. Um, but clearly, you're right that it is a systematic um, concern. I, I did want to just talk, ask a question about um, the possible collaboration between the district and I know you're just kind of talking about this to try to bring Chris Edmund here. Um, I also wanted to interject though because the Graduate School of Education, their urban justice um, program has some really, really strong, they brought in some really strong new scholars into that program. So I think that would even be a good resource for us to look at. Um, to bring in that's local, that doesn't cost as much money perhaps as Chris, um, but who would be really valuable in having these kind of conversations here as well. What's it called? What, what's the program called? The um, urban well, it's the Graduate School of Education's right, Urban Justice, goes. Urban mm -hmm. Education Social Justice Program. I'm probably not getting the name correct, oh, well, but um, anyway. their graduate social. school, their School of Education now has a dedicated, you know, urban education program cool. and so as a part of that program they brought in some really high quality you know urban educators really trying to support teachers who are working in the hood as Chris Evans does they don't have his name and reputation just yet but they are just as good in terms of knowing the issues and being able to possibly come here that and do the kind fantastic. of you know work that you want to see happen here in terms of really bringing that to our staff. So. Right. And I think it would be great to be able to put together something like that, because one of the things that we talked about in the last year really wanting to do was to bring the undoing racism mm -hmm. yeah. curriculum into the school. But it is so yeah. prohibitively yeah. expensive. Yeah. Yeah. It's just uh, right. The, the money's just not there for it. So if we could right. put something, something else. Yeah, because you're right, that we've right. left that conversation because, oh, yeah. we can't, and then now we're, we've lost it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But this would be a good. Yeah. We can talk about that in our next Equity and Excellence meeting. I like that. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like a good idea. Right now. And, and there was a quote that I found. I looked up the book as um, we were watching the clip. And um, the, the quote that I found was pretty insightful. And I wanted to share it with everyone. It was um, the book title. And it's, this is from the Washington Post article that was written about the book. About um, what book? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, um, the For White Folks Who Teach in the Hood. Oh, Chris's the book. Yeah, Chris's book. 
Um, the book title and its pointed challenge to white teachers to examine their own practice is meant to help teachers turn classrooms into places that are more hospitable and effective and even joyful for kids who often see school as a hostile place that's disconnected from their lives. So this is part of a bigger conversation about the culture and the climate that we have in each building. And unfortunately, um, I know from, from being a parent here that there are many times when my kids have used the word prison to describe their experience of certain buildings at certain times. I think that that's for lots of different reasons. It's not you know, any one particular experience, but there is not, um, I would say there is not a sense of joy many times that I, you know, we discuss this. Um, so that's just, I thought, a, a really important thing for us to consider when we're talking about climate and culture that we're not talking about it because it feels good. We're talking about it because it makes a, you know, an extreme difference to kids who um, should feel safe and happy when they're here. And that should motivate them to be here. OK. Anybody else have anything? Um, yeah, I actually wanted to uh, just interject a bit. Um, I guess uh, when we're talking about um, the sort of stuff that you, I guess, learned in the conference. Um, that, you know, talking about the individuals that can really impact students in terms of uh, equity and um, helping disadvantaged groups. I think I would uh, like to stress that those individuals, more than any other teacher, I think, are student counselors um, and um, uh, school psychologists that uh, help the students in terms of finding uh, work or life after uh, high school. Um, and right now, that's a huge issue in the high school that a lot of students um, have come to different board reps to uh, really emphasize is that uh, our counseling staff is really um, underfunded. And I understand that we uh, already have issues with our budget. Right. Um, but just to relay some of the students' opinions on that. Yeah, I think this does certainly go back to the larger conversation we were having last week, right? Of all kinds of competing priorities and needs and lack of funding and yeah. And after a, a decade of kids being overtested and teachers being overburdened and classes getting larger, it's not having a great impact on morale for teachers or for students or for just about anybody, unfortunately. Didn't see that coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we really thank all of our teachers who are in there every day, <laughs> um, you know, working with our kids and, you know, doing the best of what is very difficult situations for a lot of kids who come to you every darn day. So thank you very much. We can only imagine what it's like. Even being the wife of a teacher, I can't 100% understand what it's like because he's the one standing there in front of that room of 20 or 30, however many kids with nine bajillion different needs and experiences. And um, so it's a lot. Our kids go through a lot. Our teachers go through a lot. Everybody in our buildings go through a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> and there is no easy fix. There's no, even if we had all the money, there's no easy place to throw all the money to, you know, magically make it all better. There just isn't. Um, so, but yes, I, I think you're right that the, um, should that magical money fall out of the sky, one of the places that it really does need to go is into, um, and, and you know, this is kind of something we talked a little bit about last week and after the meeting I kind of wished I had talked about it a little bit more, um, was that what I wanted to talk about was how the board really is trying to put the little bit of money that we do have towards these priorities, right? towards having a dean of restorative practices, towards making sure we have a principal and vice principal in both the middle school and the high school so we can try to get a handle on discipline and behavior, um, putting Mr. Harrison into the, into the school so we can make sure our hallways are safe, um, you know, trying to make everyone feel as safe and secure, teachers and students included, um, as possible with everybody working with a very difficult set of circumstances. All right. Thank you, sir.
so we will move on to our board committee reports. Uh, we'll start with curriculum and instruction. Michelle, you don't have a lot, and I don't know that you even have anything new from there last week. I don't think you do. Here. No, I don't think I have anything new at all. Okay. Um, anything else? Did you guys meet in the past week or? Not in the past week, no. no but well, there was a conversation that Rob Reslevich started about some of um, some of these. Um, well, number four, precisely, um, the English 11 with honors option. Mm -hmm. And so in an email discussion, just the three of us, I guess, he was asking about um, why that wasn't happening across um, subjects and grade levels, but I think more specifically grade levels. So why were we just talking about English 11 with honors option and not other, other levels? I think the biggest answer is because there's still issues that need to be worked out in terms of um, there's stuff that the board needs to work out with the union, there's, you right. know, training issues, there's, you know, we're kind of trying to do this a bit at a time and get as much, you know, information back from the teachers who are teaching these classes and from the students who are in these classes so that we can feel more comfortable and confident moving on in a... That was my educated answer, yes. educated guess answer. <laughs> Um, we're putting our, our second foot into the water. Yeah. As it were. Yeah. With what grade? What would be the next? I don't know. Oh. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's even been decided what would be what would be next. And I mean, I think a lot of it also depends on, you know, the teachers who are, you know, interested in getting that additional training and, and taking that on. And right. so, I mean, the hope is that it will continue to expand beyond these two to these two courses but right. yeah I think his question was more about grade level like I said so um, he was wondering if there were any answers as to why that wasn't being rolled out in the history department in other grades younger grades and I think that in ninth and tenth we don't have as far as I understand we don't have um, a tremendous difference between the honors classes and the CP classes but I could I be know. wrong I have no idea if other classes are going to be integrated into that program um, Rob was asking whether or not we should be rolling out the honors options into lower levels or lower grade oh. levels of history rather than crossing over to the English department. I think right now we're you know, looking for teachers who are interested in and intrinsically motivated to go here. So um, I don't know if it's an option necessarily. We're not going to, we don't want to require other teachers to go with honors option, we'd rather them first come to us and say, hey, we'd like to try this. And right now, Mr. McCray is the individual who's offered to do that. So mm -hmm. philosophically speaking, I mean, that's a discussion I could have with Mr. Lassiter, but I, I don't, don't think it would change our approach. Mm -hmm. Un unless, unless there are other teachers in the lower grades who are interested in being part of this. So far, they haven't expressed interest. Okay. Yeah, I would assume if they see success that they would be more likely to volunteer right and hopefully by the end of the year we're gonna have another presentation right on how this is going in the classes yeah, that I it's do happening. plan on asking mr. Broadfoot if you want right. to come out excellent okay um, so anything else on curriculum and instruction right now nothing new oh, okay um, so let's move on to finance and facilities uh, mark yeah uh, Darcy thank you so we have a handful of new items from last last week the uh, first one is an item three the cafeteria bill list. That's from uh, March 9th through 9th, March 15th. Uh, item five is the approval of the treasurer's report. And that's the treasurer of school monies as of January 31st, 2019. And that's coupled with the uh, board secretary's report. Um, and that's uh, Linda certifying that as of uh, January 31st, 2019, no budgetary line item has been overextended in violation of the appropriate regulation. Item number uh, seven is uh, the board certification that sufficient funds are available to meet the district's financial obligations for the remainder of the year. The next new item is part of item 10, uh, approval of contractors. This is the approval of Title I funds, so that's federal government funding, to the uh, amount of $9,590. Uh, 
It's Young, audience, young Audiences Arts for Learning. It's an 11 day artist residency, storytelling residency, young audience staff planning and coordination. And it's in, in, in essence one 11 day artist residency with five classes of 20 to 25 students. And that'll be held in May and June. Item 13 has one new item, which is approval of bedside instruction. And that's uh, for um, one student um, at the rate of, uh, a tuition rate of $48 per hour, effective March 18th. I think, oh, I did want to point out again, before I go on, uh, our acceptance number 14 of the Highland Park Education Foundation grants. Again, I wanted to thank the, for the board, the HPEF for a variety of uh, grants to teachers, um, which we see several times per year. Uh, this is for three grants in the middle school, three grants in the Bartle School, and a grant in the high school. So thank you uh, to the uh, Highland Park Education Foundation. And also to the teachers for applying for and, the grant. Yes, and of course for the teachers who apply for this. Um, then there should be more to come. We see these several times a year. And I believe that those are the only new items. I did want to say one or two very brief words about the, the new sets of doors in the school, two schools. Uh, we are approving uh, bids so that we can uh, put uh, new, new doors at two of our schools. Uh, this is um, a uh, program that we previously have discussed for the last year. Um, it's also something that came out of the School Safety Committee, so we'll be getting uh, more serious uh, entryways um, in, um, in uh, security vestibules at, uh, at uh, uh, Bartle School um, and also at the high school. Um, and this is coming from money which is in our capital reserve in the 2019-2020 um, budget. So much as the Title I funding, which is federal money, it's not coming out of the uh, uh, tax collections, so to speak, um, this is also coming out of money which is not impacting the budget for 2019-2020. Um, in as much as coming out of a capital reserve, which currently has approximately $800,000 in it, and has to be budgeted and used for capital improvements of the schools. So, Mark, to clarify, that cannot be taken, we can't take money out of that and use it to say hire a new teacher. No, nope. we cannot take we money out of that except for the purpose of a capital improvement of our schools. I see. Right. I and see. all this is doing is getting Bartle and the high school to the same place that the that Irving and the middle school are. Irving and the middle school are the, the newer buildings. Sure. This is how newer buildings tend to be built with this double entry glass so people can see who is out there. Right. Bartle and the high school don't have that. So this is. Um, and, and I did, oh, well, I'm sorry, please. Oh, I just was going to ask, I, I think I might have missed this at the last meeting. Is it Bartle or the high school that was going to have some sort of a shatterproof glaze attached to the windows that was going to make them significantly more both expensive? Of them. Both of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind yeah. of expense are we talking about with that? That's going to be done at a later time. That's not part of the project. Oh. We'll be buying the um, material and installing it ourselves. I see. That's, that's not part of the 21000 no. Okay. I and, see. and there are several components to the to the capital funding in 2019. This is one of them. Um, uh, more security towards a uh, better uh, camera system, cloud-based camera, modern camera system. Um, also some roof improvements. Um, also with the possibility that the county and the borough would pay for the large majority of the improvements to the replacement for the field and the track. Uh, 175,000 is being budgeted uh, for those improvements from our capital reserve. If that doesn't happen, let's say the county doesn't approve a grant, that money will just get rolled over into next year. Um, I did want to make one other thing more clear because a few of the board members have asked me uh, privately about the uh, computer initiative, both for the students and, and our teachers. 
That's money that's being uh, put in uh, for a, uh, via a lease. It's a four-year lease is, is what's being uh, proposed and I believe will be done. That will include every teacher or at least every classroom with a teacher having their own um, uh, laptop uh, uh, on loan from the district, a new modern laptop, and also uh, every student from sixth grade, I believe, to uh, through 12th grade uh, getting a Chromebook. Uh, the Finance Committee evaluated what have we been spending to buy equipment piecemeal over the last five to eight years. And what we realized was if instead of buying piecemeal, we simply did a lease, a four-year lease, we could buy an effect for everyone, or a lease for everyone. And that would mean that all students would have their own Chromebook and all teachers would have their own loan leased uh, laptop in the classroom. And uh, this won't cost, if anything, very, very much more than what we had already planned to budget for replacement computers on carts and replacement laptops for teachers whose laptops had become obsolete or weren't working. Uh, the difference uh, might have been five or ten thousand dollars in either direction in a thirty six million dollar budget so uh, we're ho very hopeful that this will m make for great improvements for both teachers and for students right. without without incurring any extra costs uh, appreciable than what we 've been spending uh, for the past few years uh, for past eight or nine years and the biggest concern was one of the concerns that the board has brought up time and time again, which is equity concerns about how homework is assigned, who does or doesn't have access to computers, right. students that can't get their work done because they don't, have, they don't have access to a computer. So the combination of students in grade six through 12 having their own devices and the late bus that we've been able to institute, we're hoping will address a lot of those concerns and um, make it much more possible for a larger swath of our student body to actually complete the work that they're being, being assigned. Right, and, and, and exactly, and, and as I said uh, last week, if, if, if anyone who didn't hear, we, we, um, this came out of board discussions at this table, but also policy committee discussions where we were discussing what could we do in policy to implement a homework program that made sense for the district. And the only program that made sense for the district would, would be that every student where they might get a homework assignment that required a computer would have a computer because like many other districts in the state, we're, we're going to provide that computer for the students through the lease program. I wanted to um, point out that you know, there was a lot of thought given to just getting rid of online homework. I mean, not by Mark. <laughs> <laughs> or by Dr. Taylor. But you know, there were suggestions to that effect because you know, this board has sort of a long time resistance to spending money on tech when we could be spending money that directly impacts students, uh, you know, from, uh, well, this directly impacts students. We could be spending money on staff. We could be spending money on other types of programs. Um, however, it just became clear that it was not going to be feasible to outlaw online homework and computer homework as much as some board members might, like myself, might have hesitated to, you know, weren't that enthusiastic about online homework. Um, so th that's why we're doing it, because we can't have some students, a good chunk of our students, unable to do their homework. Um, you know, it's not, I'd rather not spend the money, even the extra $10,000. But I think that given that we feel the technology is, you know, the way of the future and, and teachers are very committed to it in their, uh, in their curricula, there really wasn't a huge amount of choice. And we also felt, we also felt when we did this budget that the, the teachers deserve to have modern equipment. Oh, the teachers and, themselves, yes. You know, and, and, yeah. and when we looked at the budget, that was no so, so to lease that extra equipment, and, and what were we going to spend on upgrading old equipment, right. it just made absolutely no sense to, uh, 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 to do anything different. And, and we, had, we had input from Keith and from the association on this and right. other board members, and uh, I think, you know, we're 
I hate to say this trite statement, but we're in the 21st century, and peop, I think our students really should learn yes. um, if they are, you know, getting homework, it, uh, and it can be done more easily and, and better as a learning experience on the computer. This is a useful thing. Yeah, this doesn't mean we want to replace our teachers with computers or have no. all online work in our classes or any of those things. And, you know, I am, I am quite certain that the curriculum committee is, you know, going uh -huh. to be working ardently to ensure that that doesn't happen. Right. Um, but for me, it just it very simply became an equity issue. Right. It was it was the all simplest solution to a really persistent equity issue that we have not been able to solve. Um, so I just wanted to interject really quickly, but um, part of this equity issue is outside of our control, and I think that everyone listening should um, make a point of learning more about uh, what's happening in the world of net neutrality legislation. Yeah. This is a tremendous part of this conversation, especially when we talk about equity issues, because having access to Wi-Fi is something that many of us might take for granted. Well, it, but the computers are going to be set up so the students don't require having Wi-Fi to do. Yeah, I, could you I explain some of that to the. Yeah, I mean, yeah. no, I can't. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. But that's part, certainly part of the conversation. Yeah, is that it's they're not going to be required to have the Wi-Fi to do what they need to do. That's so, wonderful. So yeah. teachers will be modifying the online curriculum so that well, it can be... John says, uh, I, I think it was Christina actually who pointed oh, out that right. we have some way of setting up the Chromebooks so that students will be able to use them, even the like whole Google suite of apps right, or right, whatever, right. Without, offline. Yeah, being able to do it online. Clearly they're not going to be able to collaborate with classmates, right. Right. but... but they can but, sit together. But then also, that. when the students have their own laptops and they can be here after school because now there's a late bus, right. they will have that opportunity to collaborate and use the district's Wi-Fi and not have to go to Dunkin' Donuts or go, you know, like, oh, or, right. you know, whatever. So all that's been, I mean, uh, no one's saying it's going to be perfect and, you know, nothing is ever perfect right. or 100% equitable, but I think we're making it as equitable as we humanly yeah, can. I, I was I want, talking in the broad terms. Of right. Well, I just want to kind of keep us a little grounded. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can, we can really can. I just want to make sure that we really do a lot of PD to make sure everybody knows how to use Google Suites offline. Um, that's not evident to a lot of, you know, relatively fluent users like myself. There's going to be a learning curve for I'm sure. sure there is, but I hope that there'll be some, like, direct, top-down direction. Yeah. Not expect teachers to sort of figure it out on their own or sort of figure out if there's any students that don't have Wi-Fi, you know, that sort of thing. I have a quick question about um, maintenance. I know, Mark, we talked about this before, yes. but can you just talk about the cost and of the maintenance when you're under a lease system like this? How does that work? Is that budgeted into? Yeah, uh, for one thing, uh, we've ordered in, uh, a, f uh, a fair amount of extra machines which come under the budget that, in effect, replace the piecemeal purchasing. So let's say a machine, well, first of all, the machines will be insured to a certain extent by the district. We will have extra machines. We do have sufficient staff now to manage those machines. If a machine um, gets misconfigured, um, that can, in the software, that can be rectified by our staff. If a machine literally breaks, we do have those spares that we put into the lease. And again, on a case of a stolen machine, uh, a lost machine, uh, there have been extra machines allotted so that we have something to give a student very quickly. Okay. Uh, and I, 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 I would, uh, there's a lot of information. Uh, a few years ago, we looked at this, and there was very little information about it, and only a few districts were doing this, a handful of districts. There's a lot more information now. So if you go online and you look at the, the kind of agreements that a family signs when the a machine gets assigned to their, to their child, that's been thought through by a lot of districts. I mean, not a lot, but the, the districts that have done it. And we have a very good template, which um, uh, uh, Christina Nicosia will, will have, has access to for us to, start, uh, to have a starting point mm -hmm. so that we can uh, uh, give those out and properly maintain and, and update and uh, replace machines as warranted. Uh, it's not going to be perfect. There are going to be glitches, but this has to just be far better in 2019. Um, then, um, depending on people having machines at home, students having machines at home. Mm 
Okay, if everybody's good there, I'd like Just to Just on. one yeah. more question for, um, I guess for Scott. So just like Mark was describing how our capital reserve money is earmarked for certain projects and, and cannot be used in another way, um, can you talk a little bit about Title I funds and how those are should be appropriated? Well, I can give you a brief overview. I used to be the Title I coordinator in Little Silver. So you can only use ESSA funds, Elementary and Secondary Education. Success Act. Education Act. Also, thank you. <laughs> Um, title one, two, three, and four. Four is uh, sometimes provided for technology for certain purposes. Your school either has to be de designated a title one school, or as we think we will become, your district can be considered, or school wide, they refer to it as, can be considered uh, able to use those funds. We don't. We're not. We will not necessarily receive additional federal money in title one if we're district wide, but it means we have more flexibility of its use. Oftentimes, the target populations are your low socioeconomic students, um, your ESL students. That's what Title III monies are used for. For Title I, besides low socioeconomic uh, status students, it could be students who the state has identified are lagging on the standardized test results behind their peers. And so for us, it's um, depending on the school, it's usually your your students of color, your Hispanic students, your special education students, and your low socioeconomics students. So you can't just use Title I money for anything. You have to use it for those specific purposes. And the coordinator, who for us is Jen Knapp, has to have written in the application what those funds are going to be used for ahead of time. Oh, so sort of like applying for a grant. She has to apply for that Title I? It's very, yes. Okay. In fact, they call it an entitlement grant. So We're it's already to the been delineated when it goes out to the to the feds as to what it's going to be used for, and they approve of it or not. Correct. And there's a lot of reporting. Um, oh, Jennifer has to do a whole report in June coming up to show that all the money was used appropriately. And she's the one who's been staying on top of trying to get us approved to be a Title I district, which is sometimes, you know, we were talking about it a few weeks ago, sometimes we like miss the application by, you know, like 0.3%, you know, and they won't approve it. So it looks like we're, looks like she's gotten it, looks like she's gotten it across the, the finish line, but we'll see. So do we know what this um, young audience's arts for learning, what, is that a particular building or? I believe that's, Irving, but let me get back to you on that. Okay, because it is a big chunk of change. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's a is, real big chunk of asking. change. Yeah. It would be nice to have a little more information about that. Do you want to table it? Um, if it's possible without, I mean, I'm sorry. Right. Why don't we table it? I'll have it'd be Ms. nice Nap to get, get a little bit more, a little more information on such a big expense, even though it is Title One funds, but. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. So we'll table that and get a little bit more information for next month. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions on any of the finance and facilities items? No. Nope. Thank you. Okay. So can we move on to personnel, Anne? Yes, we can. All right. Let's see here. Let me get to personnel here. Um, all right, there are very few new things uh, compared to what we discussed at last, last week's workshop agenda. We have a new maternity replacement hire. Um, this is uh, Cassandra Serrano, Serrano, excuse me, at Irving School. Um, I understand that she has been working in the classroom for quite some time, for this, all of the school year so far, I think, in the classroom where she will be now serving as the maternity leave replacement. So that's wonderful, wonderful for our students to have someone who's already familiar with that classroom and with their specific students. Um, we're very lucky in that regard. Uh, we have a new um, uh, staff member being added to this list of staff being paid to write material modification lesson plans. Those are, are those for um, students with special needs, Scott? That's personnel number four. Oh, sorry, which number? Personnel number four. Okay. Writing ma material yeah, modification. Yeah, that's, I, hold on, let me get back to it. I'm almost positive. It must be a differentiation uh, thing. So these are for the teachers who covered the program that uh, Ms. Claslow vacated when she moved to Irving. These teachers provided the substitute who we hired oh, the plans to implement. That's right. I think you did tell us about that and I just forgot. Um, hold on one second. 
Um, we have a new, number nine is a new maternity disability slash childcare leave. Um, I see we have a volunteer uh, soft, uh, I just lost it. Ah. Volunteer softball coach at the middle school, Ms. McManus-Smith. Um, thank you. <laughs> may, I, may I ask, just uh, as an academic matter, why is that a volunteer position for a, a staff member? Is that just because she's nice? Or are we not, why are we not paying her? <laughs> I, I have to ask her. I'm guessing she wants more experience in the coaching field, and this is one way to do it, but we can talk about that later, Ms. McManus-Smith. I, I mean, I, I assume this has already been worked out, but I was curious to know why. There was no paycheck listed here for Ms. McManus-Smith. <laughs> but I'll leave that to your investigatory powers. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ms. McManus-Smith, either way. I'm sure if you are paid, it's not going to be that much. Um, <laughs> uh, OK, number 24, we have approval of a source for teachers substitute for volunteering. Scott, what, I didn't understand what this means. Does this means, mean that a source for teachers sub that just wants to observe uh, classes and, for her? And own? also assist. Sorry? And also assist in the intervention class, so she's a substitute. So is she volunteering, or are we hiring her through Source for Teachers? I mean, Correct. So she's an individual who's on our Source for Teachers approved list, but who also wants to pick up some observation time, so she simply wants oh, to observe oh. this day. I see. This is part of her education. Correct. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, approval of district overnight chaperones. I have an addition to that. This is um, number 25 is a list of... Uh, staff members who will be chaperoning various overnight trips. And to that list for Camp Bernie, wow, is Bartle back at Camp Bernie now, not at Camp Mason? It seems so. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Or maybe that's just the sort of title of the program. No, it's Camp Bernie no, it's again. A camp. No. Uh, okay, all right. Well, no, no, I know it was, <laughs> yeah, it was a camp. Um, there's three new teachers to be added to the list. I think, Linda, you already have this, um, but I'll read it to the record. Uh, three additional chaperones. Uh, I'm moving that we pay three additional chaperones for overnight trips. Uh, Ms. Stratodakis, Andrew Berenger, is that how you pronounce that? Mm -hmm. And Amanda Yonks uh, for Camp Bernie, two nights at $85 per night. And that seems like not enough money to pay no. staff to spend a night at Camp Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> Based on my husband's experience, it was $85 was a <laughs> jump change. We do it for love. Sweet. And our husbands paid to go. Yeah, they paid to go. They paid $150. <laughs> Wait a minute. They paid mm. for the privilege. I had a great time. I Out loved love. Yeah, you loved it. I'm glad I have boys. I, <laughs> I was not uh, motivated to go on that trip. Um, okay, so uh, and after that and that would be it. Good. All right. Any, could, anybody could have ask, anything for Anne? Yeah, could I ask you about number three or make a comment about number three? Is that the maternity yes. replacement? Yes. Go yes. ahead. We emailed about this. Yeah, we, we, we discussed it and I discussed it with uh, Ruth because Ruth, Ruth was so uh, kind to point out to me that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, one option uh, for, which we discussed two or three years ago in the budget mm -hmm. for long term uh, substitutes was um, hiring them as, at a fixed rate through a source for teachers. And we did that for a while, and it's kind of stopped. And I know it was difficult, but we're really in a seriously difficult place financially right now. So I'm gonna vote for this. I certainly wouldn't not vote for this. I'm gonna vote for number three. Um, but I would like the Finance Committee to discuss it again. Uh, so, um, for Scott and, and for Linda, uh, at our next meeting, um, uh, we should put this on the agenda, a discussion of um, long-term substitutes, because I believe two years ago we budgeted based on, on, on using source for teachers for long-term substitutes. Um, the board discussed it, the committee discussed it. Uh, there were uh, very significant savings. And uh, again, it was difficult, especially for certain areas, to find uh, substitutes. But we just, we're just in, in, in this, we're in the place now that we, we, need, we need to look for, at, at everything. And this is something we should look at. I think I, I, I recall that too. I, I think I also recall that we had um, brought in a, at least a couple at, at that rate who then left for full jobs. So I wonder, what, could you bring to that meeting, Scott, yes. um, an analysis of you know, what happened, how many we may have brought in since that time, 
at that at the flat rate what happened to them what was the success rate and why we would you know want to go in a different direction perhaps in the future yeah and, and I'm not I'm not saying that that idea and what some other districts do uh, the example the example is Edison which has a flat rate um, you want to be a long-term 40,000 it doesn't matter uh, annualized 40,000 rate take it. You and do it. They're a very large district. They may have lots of needs in lots of areas, and it may be easier for them. Um, but it would be good to know how it worked, why it did or didn't work, and see what the right course would be after we've done it once before. Could I ask a question about that? Yeah. So would you, would you envision us still going out um, and interviewing a range of people to find the best person and then sort of asking them to contract with Source for Teachers? Or would you envision just going out to the pool of Source for Teachers? It, it's, yeah. the, it's the latter. Uh, uh, the former. Pardon so me, the former. Like give so we would, a broad... we would interview yeah. people okay. telling them, though, that this is, the, this is the rate you'll be hired at and sign up if you haven't already for Source for Teachers okay. and we'll hire you off the list. We did this for a number of people. Sure. Um, as Rob points out, it may not have worked perfectly. It was harder to, or well even, it was harder to find the people. Um, I think, I mean, I would rather do it this way, frankly. Um, but we really have uh, issues and, and every, every dollar counts. I was gonna say penny, but <laughs> pennies are another story. Dollars, every dollar counts. Yep. And every $10,000 count. I mean, so, if there, so if there are five of those, and we save thirteen thousand dollars on each one of them, over the court or, that, or 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 a a portion of that uh, prorated during the year, that's it's a, a significant job. amount it's of a money. Job. And I think that year we lowered the budget line. Um, if I remember, it's a while ago for by forty or fifty or sixty thousand dollars. It was a significant amount. So I just want to revisit it. I'm not. I don't have a perspective, I'd like to get more information. No. Um, Point well taken. And I will vote for this. In, um, I'm not sure about the middle school, but in terms of substitute teachers, in the high school, um, uh, I, we still have them, but it's also done by um, just putting all of the classes in the cafeteria. Right, so right. if you're looking like for ways to save money, right. that was another like savings that, that we did. School. That was done the yeah. same year as a, as a savings uh, uh, as a way to, to have savings. We, uh, the uh, uh, committee, but I, I would say really Linda, m more than us, you know, as we discussed it, what does it cost us to have substitute for every class every time someone is out versus what many districts did in the past, which is to put all of the students in one place with one or two or whatever number of substitutes. There was significant savings and often not very much difference you know, for that, for that one day. Um, so we did it. And I think it has, it has co given us some savings. It'd be good to know how it's working for, I remember at the time we first discussed this, there was some concern about kids, you know, with special needs and kids who maybe need extra support in large unstructured social environments. Um, it'd be nice to know if there have been any incidents or if we've been able to put para support in there, particularly, um, I don't know if this is just at the high school or if it's done in, just at the high school. Still, would be good to know if they're if they're. Could we find out about that? It, it actually brings to mind another totally, well, partially related question, related to Source for Teachers itself, in terms of how well we are actually doing bringing in, filling openings that exist during a school day. Uh, let's say we have ten or fifteen or twenty, and we go out to Source for Teachers. Are we filling those? I mean, are we actually are they doing a good job for us? in terms of filling um, you know, one day or two day or five day slots? That's a separate question. And are there options? I mean, you know, yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how well that's going. I, I kind of have my doubts. Scott, what, <laughs> Scott really, I think that that's mostly for you, that question. How is, it, how is that going? Uh, do we have any hiccups when it comes to uh, using Source for Teachers? Um, to provide us substitutes on a day-to-day? -day. We still have a problem, and it's still, we, we, we still daily have unfilled positions. We do, okay. Um, my colleagues, uh, we know, we've actually came up with a superintendent roundtable meetings, uh, which is throughout the, uh, the, the question, hey, does anybody have a really good substitute service? 
it seems like there, seems like the systemic problem is we, there are just not enough substitutes to go around. One thought that came across my desk, I think uh, it was a meeting I had with one of our faculty, was to raise our sub rate, our sub pay rate. We did. Didn't we already do we that? We raised it substantially. But to attract, to, to. We already did though. We did that. Well, but do it again, again? because apparently we're not, I haven't done the research, no, but we no, might not no, be no. in competition. No, we're very competitive right now. We don't need to raise that. Well, we don't need to. Raise I, it that. came up. So. Come speaking as the substitute <laughs> <laughs> teacher at the it table. Came up. I, now, and I know that's a difficult question to book, but a uh, topic to bring up during this difficult budget time. So, Scott, I, I, I did want to give some perspective from 25 and 30 years ago on my last uh, uh, board tenure, which was that the the, the uh, uh, situation of getting substitute teachers into the classroom, uh, which was done back then by making phone calls from a phone list. And somebody was, somebody was responsible, someone in the system, I don't even know who, but somebody in the system, it might have been per school, it might have been done out of the central office, someone got on the phone and made phone calls the day before or the morning of and spent as much time as they needed to get the substitutes. It was a nightmare. <laughs> it came up every month, uh, and, and it, it wasn't just difficult to fill position, it was, it was impossible to fill positions, and it was time consuming, and it was labor consuming, and that's why you have a business now called Source for Teachers and perhaps others, because they make that job they filled the need. They filled the need that we have and other districts have. Some, some entrepreneur type got the, uh, you know, got the idea, let's do this, and they did it. Um, but it was, it was worse. It was worse. It was a constant, constant problem. Um, my my uh, wife, uh, Nora, who many of you know, was, was um, home uh, raising kids, our kids, and as uh, she uh, as the kids got older, she uh, first uh, did substituting and then went back to teaching and then went back, you know, went to the, uni you know, ended up at the university teaching. Um, and she did substituting. And when she was available, when she put her name on the list with Highland Park as an available sub, we got called every single morning. They could not find anyone. So it, it has to be a worse situation. I, maybe times have changed, I don't know. But it was a terrible situation. With Source for Teachers, Scott, do you know, is there such a thing as a, as a hybrid plan where you perhaps, well, let's say we had 10 people on a list or whatever that uh, would be our go-to people that may not be Source for Teachers but are certified where we could use those people as well as the Source for Teachers. That's people. intriguing. No, I mean, I, some of I, those may be local people. Could do anything with I don't know. I, I assume we can do anything we want. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Let's chew on this maybe next month. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. I like that idea. All right. Um, if nobody has anything else for personnel, uh, let's move on to policy. Okay. So, so we we only have the one policy. It's for second reading. It's the suicide prevention policy, which we've discussed now for a month or more maybe two months or more, um, and I just recommend, as, as we have this as a recommendation of the superintendent, we've all spent a lot of time on this in policy, and I think we recommend that this is an excellent improvement of, over what we've had. And uh, we are meeting in a week or two, and we'll have some more. I hope we'll, we'll have a number of, uh, n we've spent so much time on this, we will spend time on some new policies and have something to bring forward in the next month or two. Awesome. Um, I, I went through it today and printed it out. I had found just a few typographical things okay. that need to be tweaked. Nothing, okay. nothing that changes meaning or anything. Terrific. Just So I will give that to you. Remind me after the meeting. Okay. Could um, you perhaps give it, give it to Scott because I think Susan has the master ah, copy. Okay. I'll do that. Um, does anybody have any questions about that policy or anything else? My only quick comment is one thing that I, I think we keep maybe not following up on is I think um, uh, Strauss-Esme 
is supposed to give us a list of policies that need to be reviewed yearly. And I'm not sure we're Oh, we've been following it. In fact, what we do is we set up our agenda to pick away at the audit. A couple of things have bumped our progress, but you know, we followed it religiously. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we've been doing a pretty good job, yeah. I think. If yeah, Scott, Scott's been setting an agenda based on the, the uh, required policies right. uh, that we're behind on. Right, because we get the alerts, but then right. there's also like a subset that was like, these you're supposed to review every yes. year. Yes, yes. Scott's been putting those together. We have a nice okay. list. Many of them, I think if we hadn't spent so much time on the, the attendance and the lateness and the suicide prevention, the um, that list, uh, many of those items on that list are really relatively simple to go through. Okay. I think if we hadn't uh, spent the hour on those or two hours on those, as opposed to the hour or two repeatedly on the attendance, lateness, and suicide prevention, we would knock those right through those. Okay. And um, I don't think any of them are very difficult or controversial. Okay, I good. Like I'm glad that they're. I just wanted to make doing, sure that we're they're doing well still with this. Uh, okay. Awesome. Can I, can I ask about that though? Are we still, are you still going to alert equity and excellence as to the policies that do pertain to equity issues and when you, when they come up through the docket, so to speak? <coughs> That's so a good we point. I, uh, that? We were, I mean, originally my idea before I sort of lost track of everything um, was, you know, every time we had policies that were coming up to farm them out to the committees. Oh, yeah. So like if, we, if I knew in advance we're going to be discussing restraint, I would farm that out to, you know, the, right. Um, and then I sort of stopped doing that when I was policy chair because I ran out of time. So that's something I, we certainly uh, should do. I will right. make sure to do that. <laughs> I'm sure well, Mark will do that. I will make sure to do that. <laughs> I was I not promise. a role model for Mark in that regard, I'm, I'm unfortunately. Good at, I'm good at that. I will make sure. Well, it's also good just to kind of share the burden. You yeah, know? yeah, So yeah, policy yeah. Isn't, isn't responsible for every single last policy. Okay. Uh, Blumink. Do you have anything for us for equity and excellence? We haven't met since last week. Okay. So nothing to share. All right. All right. So that brings us to public comment. Comment. The Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and has reserved this time for your comments. If anybody would like to make public comment, now's the time. You can go up to the podium and just make sure you please state your name and if you're a resident address for the board secretary so she can record that. Or if you're a staff, you can just say your staff. Hi, uh, Lynn Fryer, 314 Wayne Street, Highland Park. Um, the acoustics. And make sure you write it down too, Lynn. Okay. Uh, the acoustics leave. in this room are really Awful. bad. Um, but I, and I did come with a couple of things on my mind. Um, I guess with the doors, I'm happy to hear that the funding is coming from a capital budget line. So. I guess I'm placated about that, but um, <laughs> I've also um, heard that the home ec programs um, have been targeted for being removed, and I that makes me sad, and I I don't think that that's really appropriate. Um, I think there's a lot of non-academic college-bound students that um, and other students I mean I think these are life skills that all students should have access to and uh, I understand that the budget's really tight but I would encourage you to look elsewhere to uh, find something to cut but I, d I don't envy any of you so thank you I appreciate that qualifier I don't envy us either <laughs> that's it Thank you, Lynn. Could I ask a question about the home ec? I think it was a surprise to a number of people. Um, did curriculum weigh in on that and you know what that would mean for course offerings for our students? Is that something that the curriculum committee discuss, was able to discuss, Michelle? Um, we did not discuss it uh, huh. as a committee. Um, and I don't think that it was something that was, um, you know, presented as a you know hard and fast decision but um so yeah, I, so I a assume preliminary budget right, right. So, so because it was a preliminary budget i thought that that would be you know something that we should talk about as a committee and um you know the the 
bottom line is is that I do feel like we are all on the same page when it comes to um, priorities. So I didn't freak out as committee chair, but um, I do feel like we should discuss it. And personnel will be discussing it as well. Yeah, yeah. Did I read somewhere or hear, maybe I watched last week's meeting from home, that the numbers were down in those classes, and that was part of the reasoning behind the decision? Well, not in home ec, I don't think. Yes. Oh, in home ec it was? Oh, I thought it was just the Bardo classes. I see. Our numbers went down slightly, but that wasn't really the, the, the rationale. Okay. Um, I mean, we've, we've had roughly between you know, the middle of the 50s to the low 60s each semester in that class. Oh, actually, in all the classes that Ms. Mitchell teaches, including baking and, and other home economic related courses. Um, so that it wasn't really behind. That wasn't so much the decision, the rationale behind the decision. I'm, Scott, I'm I, sorry, I didn't hear the numbers. What, what, what was the difference? Yeah, what was? I didn't, that wasn't clear. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Could you say the numbers again? Like how, how I, much I can actually give by? you exact numbers. Okay. If That'd be like that. The acoustics are really bad, Scott. It's, it's just so hard to hear you. The acoustics here. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, oh. this room is because the room is so large. Yeah, it's a gym. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to kind of go to this issue of was personnel notified or was curriculum, was it discussed in curriculum, when we're preparing the budget, it, I think we mentioned this at the last meeting, those decisions are the absolute last ones right. to be put on the table. That. It's not like we made that decision two months ago and didn't tell personnel and curriculum. Yeah, sure. Well, I just want to make this clear because it does kind of come across as committees are being left in the dark or something and that's just not well i mean it is how it's coming across so i want to make it clear that that's not what's happening there's a whole process that we go through over the course of months where the different building administrators come where we look at all those different budgets scott then goes back to them and says we need to take even more from that this is not a, a process anybody wants to engage in to decide what it is and where we're going to cut um, and certainly, as we discussed last week, the last place we ever want to cut is personnel. So that is the absolute last place that we're looking. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it other than, you know, that's the last ditch effort every single time. And um, I want to make it very clear that we're not making those decisions lightly or without looking at as much information as possible, without considering every other possible thing first. Uh, one of the things I've asked Scott to look at is how many staff we've added in the last few years. And it's a tremendous amount. We've increased our staff, even with scaling back, if we need to, four or five paraprofessionals and one or two staff members. The numbers are still way up over the last two to three years. So we're not, you know, we're not looking to slash anywhere. We're trying to be as responsible as we possibly can and impact as few students as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult. Nobody wants to make that decision. Ever. And there was an article in the, I think it was in the Star Ledger, maybe it was just NJ.com, I don't know. This is not something that's just happening here in Highland no, Park. This is and actually that article kind of annoyed me because it was, um, you know, a lot's being framed around S2 and around the districts that are receiving less funding. And of course, right. totally sucks to be getting even less funding. But we're not in that category. We're not in the getting less funding category. We're supposedly in the, yay for us, we got more right, funding. Right. But in grand total, again, we talked about this last week, we got 180 something thousand dollars. Almost 40 of it went straight to charter schools. Another almost 40 of it came off the top for pre-K. Yeah. Somehow yeah. they decided you need less money for your pre-K students. So we got a grand total of an extra $100,000 from the state. That's our big windfall. And we're getting letters from our legislators saying, here I am, I'm fighting for you in Trenton. What? No. <laughs> fighting for us in Trenton would look a lot different than $100,000. So, you I know. almost feel like we should be <clears throat> budgeting in like the salary f to uh, put a lobbyist uh, down in Trenton. Good luck with that. <laughs> so I, I do have some numbers. Uh, so this year, Ms. Mitchell's first semester student load is 51 total. Our second semester student load is 55 total across the class, four, uh, four classes she teaches, that does not include team five pep. Five plus team pep. 
Uh, including Teen Pep. Thought, okay, five. that didn't include yeah. Teen Pep in this yeah, case. Yeah. I was just focusing oh, okay. on the yeah. programming right, you right, know, right. Uh, numbers. Last year, um, Ms. Mitchell's first period student load was 56. Her second period student load was 75. So the numbers are going down, but that wasn't necessarily. That wasn't but one of the things that we do exactly. look at every year is undersubscribed classes. And it was the reason a couple of years ago for discontinuing Hebrew was right. that the numbers just weren't there. When we see classes that have less than 10 students in them, we have to take a look at that. We, we just do. I mean. It, now, and keep in mind, reflecting on you know, some of the numbers that Darcy alluded to, um, since this new board and I and Linda started the budget planning process, the fiscal year 16 budget was the first budget that we actually all worked on collaboratively. Since that time, we have added 20, and that includes the riffing and elimination of teachers this next year, we added um, 20 to full-time staff between teachers and paraprofessionals. That's a net. So that's that's from 2015. Since the 15, six, since the 15-16 budget, wow. we've added right. 22 right. um, we staff. That, um, so that includes regular ed, special ed, paraprofessionals, uh, an additional um, CST member, Regina Stranger, the behaviorist. That's the and that, and again, that includes so any reductions in force over the last few years, as well as next year's reduction in force. Yeah, so twenty makes sense. And, and our, our student numbers haven't gone up drastically. They've gone up enough, though. I think what this reflects is the inordinate needs our special needs population particularly has. There's a lot of those FTEs, those full-time staff or power professionals. And and frankly, I don't know how we're doing this because with that, we are also getting these. 8, 10, 12, 14% insurance increases every year, mm -hmm. plus our contractual obligations. And when you add it all up, we can raise taxes two or three or three and a half percent. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I sometimes sit at home at night going over numbers, which is what I like <laughs> to do. And it, it's astonishing to me that we can get a budget out under these circumstances. And, and the board, um, uh, as to the being sad about that program going away, no one on the board is happy about this. I, uh, when we talked about this, we were, we were all pretty horrified. That's, that's where we have to go. And I would say emails are still going around amongst the finance committee about what can we do, because there is no joy here. Um, it's where we're placed. The state could make a few simple changes, including in those changes might be a more rational look at what, what are reasonable increases uh, for staff year over year, plus the cost of the insurance, and what does it mean you really should be raising taxes? And that number, probably shouldn't say this, is not 2%, it's higher because it's in virtually impossible to make these budgets uh, um, a balance uh, with a tax increase like that. Okay. It's virtually impossible. I want to get back to public comment. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. Okay. Well, I'm, just, is this on? <laughs> Hello? Okay, I'm, I'm very nervous to be in front of a microphone. I'll make it short. I'm Christina, Cal, um, Christina Saki, and I'm a teacher here. Um, I'm a reading intervention teacher. But um, I really stand up here again uh, because of what uh, you have been talking about and um, the budget cut for the home economic um, position. Um, I just, it just uh, I'm Italian, it's really a big thing in my family to cook and enjoy the cooking and I, even if it's just a little plug from one other person to try to keep that program, I just felt, I'm gonna go out of my comfort zone and come to a microphone, but I wanna just tell you um, my experience I could not get my boys to, to want to cook. And um, although they have uncles and brothers, and um, I mean uncles and cousins that cook, they wouldn't cook until they came to an open, um, the home economic class, which was, um, it wasn't mandatory, but uh, it was strongly suggested and really pushed. And I am so thankful because I would come home and my kids would be making all kinds of different rices and, um, and of course, um, they were in high school, so I allowed them to do simple cooking, like hard-boiled eggs. They could choose, but.
but they were making amazing rice dishes and all kinds of things. I couldn't tell you my gratitude for the home economic class. To this day, my kids now have been inspired to cook. And I just know one of my students that were here in the special ed um, uh, program, that was her dream is to go on to be a culin in the culinary arts. And it is an art, and it's an amazing art. And um, so I hope you look at it like that too, because it's an important art that, um, that gets missed. And a lot of these kids may, it might open up a world to them if they were just exposed to how to use the kitchen, because many parents don't cook anymore. And it's so much fun. Really, it is so much fun. And it's a whole like hobby and art, too. And um, June's program, the GLOW program, is so amazing. They're learning this very important life skill. And if they don't have a kitchen, I mean, they won't understand even to do the basic make an egg, you know, and helping cleaning, even if it's not the, even, even if they can't do the egg themselves one day, they're learning how to clean and put away and, um, and their way around the kitchen. I'm just, um, I'm just like heartbroken that this is, um, I, I, I don't envy you at all because I can't even imagine how you're gonna try to fit this in. I mean, it could even cut me off, you know, one day, but, um, and I understand that, but I would hope that, um, you know, with my intervention program, you know, it's an extra. But home economics, I hope you don't think of it as, um, like an extra because it really is a very, very important uh, thing to have for the, especially the GLOW kids. So that's all I would say. Thank you, Ms. Stocky. Actually, that was something that we, um, emails that have gone around between the Finance Committee is how that would impact the GLOW program um, and how that facility could potentially still be used. So that's, that is on our, is absolutely on our radar. Sorry, just my eyes. Don't be sorry. So I came here with a speech. Sorry. Um, my name is Yuchachi Odikanwa, and I live in 14 Highland Avenue, South Highland Park. And one of my jobs at the school is I'm actually the student body president of our school. So I, one of my jobs there is to listen to the voices of concern that a lot of the students are giving. And I'm here to speak on the behalf of the student body about the discontinuation of family consumer science departments and the termination of six para um, professionals. As this news actually traveled through the high school, a lot of sadness and questioning on why this um, event is even happening has ar arise. And the only answer I could really give was because of budget cuts. And a lot of people, including me, have don't see seen, uh, see this as like a good answer. There are too many um, advantages of having a home economics department and more paraprofessionals around without Without them, the student body will only suffer. Um, cutting teachers would certainly make Highland Park uh, students less prepared for their future and less successful for our school and the future. When asking the opinion of some uh, students on them, they said that, they said, and I quote, paras are one of the main reasons why I'm successful in large classes with one teacher, and I wouldn't have been successful, successful in Barta without them. Paraprofessionals play some of the biggest roles in the life of the children and are absolutely essential to their learning. My another point is, uh, with the loss of the apartments, students will miss out on an opportunity of classes to shape the rest of their lives, like many previous speaker ha uh, speakers have um, addressed. Family consumer science um, teaches skills such as cleaning, healthy eating, child development, tailoring, and so much more that is a life skill that a lot of kids need. I personally can say, for example, is that if I had never took in Ms. Mitchell's class in freshman year and following up to senior year, I would not step foot in my kitchen. I wouldn't know how to boil eggs. I wouldn't know how to even cook rice. I wouldn't know how to do anything in the kitchen or even tailor my own clothes or like do anything that's a life skill that I'm gonna need after I'm done with high school or move out of my house. And it builds, school, it builds skills that students should know, and by removing that, it's only harming a lot of kids in our school. And my last point is, is mainly addressing a lot of the problems that uh, minority kids in our school have, specifically the African-American kids, is that there's only five African-American teachers here in Highland Park High School, and with the loss of a home economics department, we lose Ms. Mitchell, which is one of those fives. Not only is she a great teacher, but she's a great person whose students actually go to to combine 
um, feelings that they have or just to talk to. And after talking to one of my senior classmates, an issue that she expressed to me, and I quote, Ms. Mitchell has been so, uh, someone that I go to whenever I'm free, and she has shared with me her perspective of life and with experiences. I can honestly say that they have helped me during difficult times and made me a better person. So that's all I have to really say, for example, but. That's a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing all of that. And um, I would love to, one thing that um, we talked about last week and that Dr. Taylor and um, Mr. Krieger and I are working on is to sit down and meet with our legislators about the issues that we're experiencing financially in terms of our budget. I would love to invite you, if you would like to, to attend that meeting with our legislators so you can really get a better sense of kind of like this big global picture that we're, I, I know it's, it, it's hard to, um, I'm sure it's hard to make sense of for your fellow classmates um, what, um, what a budget restriction like we're facing is like, but I would love for you to be able to have a, a, deeper, a deeper sense of that if that's something that would interest you. That's great. So I'll have um, Dr. Taylor reach out to you about that. Hi, um, my name is June Miller. Um, I am a special education teacher at the high school. This is my 15th year with the Highland Park School District. I am very proud to say that I have been teaching the GLOW program since its inception. I'm speaking tonight because I am very concerned about the adverse effect that I believe the elimination of the Home Economics program will have on the GLOW program. As you know, a primary focus of the GLOW program is to teach the students independent living and transition skills to use when they leave high school. Many of the students in the program are students who have either returned to district after spending several years in out-of-district placements or students whose parents have considered sending them to out-of-district placements. I have attended almost every IEP meeting for the students in this program. In order to encourage the parents to keep the students in our district, the differences between the program we offer here at Highland Park and out of district placements are discussed. The deciding factor in keeping these students here is our ability to demonstrate to the parents that we offer everything and more that the out of district placements offer. Our home economics program is almost always brought up as an integral part of our program. It is probably the most frequently requested elective by the parents of the GLOW students. Without this program, I do not know how we will be able to persuade parents that our program is superior to those of the out-of-district placements. Additionally, Terry Mitchell has been an absolutely invaluable resource to me. As part of the GLOW program, I have planned several brunches, bake sales, etc. Terry has given up her free time to assist us and share the knowledge that only someone who has experience teaching this subject could have. And I'm going to digress from my speech just to add nothing to me to have a dinner in my house, 25 people. I love it. I can cook for it. Doing it and teaching it are not the same thing. I sympathize with the difficult decisions that the board must make in creating a budget. I truly, truly do. However, I also believe that the elimination of the home economics program will, one, result in a decline in the quality of the program we offer in our district, and two, result in additional out-of-district special education costs, as it will be much more difficult to prove to parents that we can offer the same program in our school as the out-of-district placements also are able to offer. So thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate your input. Dan Maladnik, uh, teacher at the middle schools, Global Civics, and a resident at 216 Graham Street. Um, I want to just share with you how I got to know Ms. Mitchell. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny. Every year we do the eighth grade model UN, and um, on that morning I go to Stop and Shop, and I'm getting all sorts of groceries you know, to, to feed the staff, the high schoolers that come there. And every year, it's, it's like, it's so funny, but every year I run into Miss Mitchell there at like 6, 6.30 in the morning, and she's getting a big a basket of stuff. And, and I don't know if she does it every day, because I only <laughs> do this once a year. I'm not usually at Stop and Shop at 6.30 in the morning. But, um, but I, it's like clockwork. I like plan on seeing her, and now it's like a running joke that we have. Um, but, uh, you know, it kind of shows me a little bit about her commitment. But um, the other thing I wanted to say about Ms. Mitchell is um, she was on the uh, committee of teachers with me and, and several other teachers 
um, for the restorative practices um, training. And we really bonded as a group. And she just really impressed me. She was just such a positive and insightful presence in that committee. I can't speak to her, you know, I, I was never in her classroom as a student, but in that committee, I was really impressed with her and, and I really, really appreciated everything that she brought to the committee. Um, had a, you know, and so I guess my heart goes out to her because, you know, I know she's got like 16 years in and she's, and I, and I haven't heard negative things about her. I've, you know, I have a positive experience with her and, um, and just to kind of see, you know, I know it's a very difficult position to be in and I don't envy you at all, um, but it's, uh, it's also, I don't envy her. <laughs> um, and it's hard for me to see where she can go. You know, if I were cut right now, who's gonna hire me? Um, so um, so I, I just feel for her. So just on a human level, I, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, and I thought she was so gracious in the way that she handled, Absolutely. Uh, like in her speech that she gave, I thought it was very gracious. And um, so I'm concerned about her. Um, one thought came to mind in the prior district that I was at, they had a culinary program there and they actually, I think, made money off of it. <laughs> like they turned it into kind of a, like the, the, the man who was running it was a chef. He was a former chef and he was teaching the, the other students to be, his students to be chefs. And he didn't have a lot of students, but um, they made these amazing dishes and we all bought them. <laughs> so, um, and, and they were making money. And so anyway, I'm just wondering if, any, if there's any possibility of revamping the program to actually bring in revenue and to try to offset some of the costs or something like that. <laughs> I like that thinking, Dan. Yeah. I mean, we are trying to come up with this therapeutic program that you know would bring students in from other districts. I wonder if there's some way, um, the special education program. I wonder if there's some way that it could be melded with that somehow. I don't know. It would be at the lower grades. Oh, that's right. You're right. Oh wait, is that right? It's not. Okay, it's just Bartle and Irving, or Bartle. It's Bartle. Right. Okay. My apologies. I, I also like that idea. I. Um, I'd like to talk about that more another time. <laughs> yeah. Good evening. Keith Presti, president of the HPEA. Um, I just wanted to give the board a bit of an update um, since last week when I spoke about some of the concerns from middle and high school staff about um, some of the discipline issues. Um, so uh, I met with Scott and Darcy last Wednesday and we did have a good conversation about that where I did share a lot of the concerns that were uh, brought to us. Um, some of those are the feelings of being unsupported, perceived lack of consequences, and the concern over the proper implementation of restorative practices. Uh, Darcy asked me to go back to the staff and um, see if we could identify clusters of behaviors. So I would just like to say that um, we did that. The staff's met today, and uh, we're meeting again, Darcy, Scott, and I, on Wednesday, and I'll be presenting that information to you um, so we can continue the conversation. Um, and I also uh, met with the Bartle staff today, and there's been a lot of discussion lately about uh, the social-emotional learning um, program that uh, we did have um, and that kind of went away and is kind of coming back um, but I would just like to make a few points about that um, and also how it relates to um, responsive classroom which is the program that we uh, say we're doing at Bartle but just to give you some numbers um, the social emotional learning lab which is what we call a tier two, it, um, is uh, right now servicing about 47 students. I think we have somewhere around 500 in the building. Um, so the um, 
SEL practices that we used to have, we would call a tier one. So that's all of the preventative and, and you know, that would be um, direct instruction on different skills, um, uh, the SEL skills, um, and, you know, infusing that into the classroom and how people teach and how they interact with their students. Um, we had a presentation today and it was uh, kind of nostalgic where they were talking about best and listening position and um, you know all of the 525 and the keep calm and you know that used to be ex we were just in, that was just ingrained in us when we started I mean every beginning the, there would be a committee they would meet over the summer they would discuss it what are we gonna work on at the beginning of the year everybody was presented with the same materials everybody had the same posters in their classroom everybody had the same worksheets the hassle logs the fig test bin uh, you know keep, everyone developed a keep calm area you know we the, the skills were actually taught uh, d through direct instruction especially in the health program um, so we, you know, and we used to be a, a beacon for SEL. Um, and, and it's not anybody who's here right now, but it went away. It, the and, Vicky Potabicki went away and it went away. Well, was, and, my, was my perception from Well, and, my, and a former superintendent who did yes. not necessarily care or yes. agree with that. A it bunch of things got dwindled broken. and it went away. When Vicky left, that was it. Um, so I do think Bringing back the lab is great. I do think we have to spend the majority of our time discussing tier one direct instruction. And, you know, responsive classroom is great and it is an act, it is an SEL program. So, and some, but there's only four teachers in this building that have been trained in responsive classroom, the real training, which is like a four day training. So, that, I think that's something we have to look at. We, if we're gonna use responsive classroom as our tier one, then everybody needs to be trained in it. We all need to be speaking the same language again. We all have to have the same resources again. Um, and, you know, and then the, the lab and uh, some of the other things are you know, where a student who might not be getting it at that, that tier one level can be referred for extra you know, support in that. Um, the, and, and my bigger point is that problems with behavior and decision making and all those things didn't just start at the middle and high school and they start here and at Irving and so we have to really look all the way down and 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 really beef up our program here um, and I do know that you know there's a lot of teachers at Irving that love responsive classroom as well um, but I think there's plenty of opportunities that we can um, uh, you, we have P lots of PLCs, we have building lever PDs, um, we bring in outside consultants all the time for other things. There, every PLC, every building level professional development should be focused on this. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of other things that, you know, we have to attend to as well, but if we're really going to be serious and say, this is, we're going to be responsive in the lower grades and we're going to be restorative in the upper grades, then I think we really have to step up our game and I'm happy to continue to talk about and ways that we can do that. But I think, you know, sometimes the frustration from the staff comes from, Who we can't just say it, we have to do it. Right. So, and, and, you know, and, and people are more than willing to do it. People are like, I still have that stuff in some way or some other, le you know what I mean? Like, when that was so strong at Bartle, I don't remember, was that also, was that same language and the same philosophy at Irving as well? No. No. Yes. I, From a former Irving teacher, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Yeah. No, and I, I, you know, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. I, I remember, like, I still, I, I carried 525 with me and used it with my littles, yep. you know, from what I had learned with my stepkids because that came home even. Right. So, I mean, it, you're right. It was absolutely just this inherent, integral part of being a Bartle it's student. It's just what we did. It, it, right, exactly. It and was what we you were, did, really. and it came it home identity. with the kids. Like, the kids actually even brought it home and used it at home. So yeah. um, I, I couldn't agree with you more that on that tier one is where we want to be reaching all of our students. So. And we happen to have 
a committee that started two months ago called the Social Emotional Learning Community, made up of guidance counselors throughout the school district and our support staff like Juliana, who are specifically looking at that, going back to that tier one model because, and frankly, you know what, it wasn't so much um, me, Tracy Maiden, Anthony Benjamin, as it was two of Maurice Elias' interns who helped redirect us. Remember, this program came out of Maurice Elias' lab way back when, thanks to Vicki Potapecki. So um, Maurice assigned two interns just to help get us back to that place. The, remember, this is the first year we fully implemented the lab again. We started the last half of second year, so it's a rebuilding effort. But Keith, you're totally on spot, on, right on, and it's definitely a work in progress. Can I? And, the, the, sorry. Oh, no, I would just like to point out again, too, that um, when we're moving away from out-of-school suspensions, that this is where we really need to be focusing, because if we beef up in-school suspension, which I think we should call it something else, but if we beef up in-school suspension and what a child will do during the day when they're in-school suspended, um, you know, that's another golden opportunity to work with... A, 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 if a student ends up in in-school suspension, they clearly need to do some work on their social emotional learning. So that's where we should be focusing some of yep. our attention as well. And instead of, you know, just having them sitting in a room all day, listen, I don't really know what happens in in-school suspension, but it, sitting in a room, sitting at home, just working on some worksheet that, you know, you have to give work when they're in in-school suspension, you know, that would be the time they should be working on these skills as well. We're on, we're on the same page. Yes. Could not agree Thank more. you, sir. Yeah. Thank I, you. I just quickly wanted to say, like, my memory as a parent, and now I have a senior and a sophomore and an eighth grader, is that the Irving, um, the Irving experience wasn't as uh, consistent with their SEL. It was there. It was clearly there. But I remember, you know, Bartle being the place where it was on a daily basis the kids would come home with... 525 and all that stuff like my husband when I get upset will say Michelle 525 <laughs> like that's the that's the kind of thing it's you know in my house too but so in the middle school that was then no longer a thing you know a lot of it has to no I just wanted to say that from my memory I don't remember it being um, as distinct in Irving as it was in Bartle Bartle was absolutely every single year every single classroom <laughs> <Here he goes. laughs> I, th I think a lot it's of it like has to do with... It's like you never left. Let me say one thing, Keith. Keith Presti, I, uh, no. I think a lot of it has to do with the principal. Kelly Freeborn was wholly committed to a responsive classroom. I mean, I think you knew that. She was like a specialist in that area. She was even serving as a consultant. It's incumbent upon the principal ultimately to shape the culture of the school building. And if responsive classroom is going to be built in this building, we need to make it a systemic effort. I totally agree that it's not happening the way it should. Responsive classroom in particular. And just, I mean, just listening to Michelle and some, what other people said, you know, using it yourself, your, your, your kids are bringing it home. I mean, that's another wonderful opportunity to include the parents in all of this and working with their children and also themselves, like, like you're saying, like all of those skills are something we all need to be able to do Absolutely. anyway. And sometimes it's a good reminder of how maybe we can handle situations for ourselves. Yeah. So what an opportunity to bring the parents in as well and the community and, and, the, and the students and all work on this together as a community. Yeah. Yeah. Bring it on. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, any other public comment? No? Okay, so we are gonna move on to our um, board action items. Um, Michelle, would you like to move the curriculum and instruction items, please? Sure. Sorry about that. I would like to move items one through four. Okay, is there a second? Second. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, I just wanted to point out that Mark, you and Keith have touched base on whatever um, negotiations issues there are related to us approving the English we have 11. A, we have scheduled option. a meeting, in fact, today. Okay. Um, I don't know if we all got back, but I think we may have a date for okay. early April. Okay, so we're all good moving forward. Yes. Okay, fabulous. All right, I'm um, sorry, any other discussion? Nope. Linda, could we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden-Dinicola? Yes. 
Okay, uh, Mark, could you please move the finance and facilities items for us, please? Yes, I believe that we're going to uh, table till next month the Young Audience Arts for Learning. Correct. Uh, so I'll move items one through 26 with the exception of that sub item on number 10. Is there a second? Second. second. Is there any discussion? Nope. All right, seeing none, Linda, can we please have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simaresti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden D. Nicola? Yes. Okay, uh, personnel and communication. Uh, Ann, could you please move those items? Yes, I'd like to move items one through 25, including the amendments that I read in to number 25. Fabulous, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? If I can make one correction yep. on item number 23, the dates should read September 3rd, 2019 to April 30th, 2020. Oh, yeah. Good point. <laughs> Good catch. Oops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Did we already do that? I, I second. Oh, sorry. All right. Any other discussion other than our correction? Nope. Okay. Seeing none, Linda, could we have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden D. Nicola? Yes. Okay, and finally, uh, Mark, could you move those, uh, our one policy item, please? Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to move item one. All right, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Nope. Linda, can we have a roll call? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Simarusti? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. McFadden D. Nicola? Yes. Okay, so that brings us to our uh, liaison reports. I noticed that there was a um, an agenda in the folder for the Municipal Drug and Alcohol Alliance, albeit not terribly illuminating, but. <laughs> There's also one for library. Ah, okay, yes, I saw both of those in there. Um, uh, Mr. Krieger, anything from any of your very No, I have summary? nothing. Okay, not I did notice, I just happened to notice on Facebook that there seems to be a, a volunteer meeting for HPTV folks coming up, although I don't remember what the date of that was. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think they're trying to uh, get some more volunteers. Get some more, yeah, get some more, I, I know, get some more I, flesh, fresh blood in there. Yeah, it's it's, it's been, a tough. There's been one very very busy person. For yes, a lot there's of years. one remarkably dedicated. Thank you, Gary Leslie. Yeah. All anyone watching us at home on TV, thank Gary Leslie because if it were not for Gary Leslie, you would not be watching us on TV. True. Um, and he needs some help, so please help Gary Leslie. <laughs> Um, <laughs> hashtag. Yeah. Oh, Gary, <laughs> We're going to start our own hashtag, our own social media hashtag for Gary Leslie. Um, uh, Rob, Magaziner, yes. anything from the Ed Foundation other so the than Ed all the wonderful things that we just approved this evening? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, and I think there actually are even a couple of additional ones that they are considering the right now. I don't know if those have found their way in but two emails I think came through today yeah so they'll, so be, they'll on the next be on the next one um, so the big thing I think uh, right around this time of year uh, is the uh, spring fundraiser so that is uh, going to be May 11th that's at the center school gym it's going to be a casino night which Ooh, uh, has those. been done before but those are I think it's oh very watch popular. out Mr. Krieger's there wait they're not there's gonna be popular, any money left yes. over once no. Mark's done so uh, you know, all things gambling. That's what they're talking about, and they will. Uh, it'll be a good good night, I'm sure. There, there'll be food, and um, I believe there is also beverage. Wait, May 11th? Oh yeah, that's oh. May 11th. Yeah, I have a conflict. But I have a conflict too. Now I'm sad. Right. Anyway, anyway, folks should be looking in their mail for the uh, invites, and you know, on social media, et cetera, et cetera. So. All right. Thank you, Rob. Uh, good night, Avery. Good night, Avery. I'll see you tomorrow.
Uh, Anne, anything from the Commission for Universal Access? Uh, no, apparently the meetings are on Mondays. I just learned um, the uh, head commissioner, the commissioner, the head of the commission <laughs> has um, indicated that hopefully uh, come June or July they are going to reschedule meetings so that board members are able to attend. And I have not yet received any agendas um, for those meetings, but hopefully soon. Okie dokie. Uh, as um, Scott mentioned, there's an, uh, an agenda in the uh, yeah, an agenda in the folder for the um, last public library meeting, um, and I don't have anything for shared services. Once again, the town commission that never meets. Um, Ruth, still no CPAC. No. I'm wondering if until like CPAC reemerges or comes back to life if would you be interested in maybe attending pto meetings sure maybe that would be you know at least there'd be something there yeah 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 would that yeah. be all right yeah. so maybe you and i should talk about that because sure. i was i'm um, excited that um you know when we were planning our budget meetings the last couple of years we've tried to have pto meetings and we try to have our own hold you know host our own meeting you know with the pto and then nobody comes and it's kind of sad so this time um scott reached out to you know the ptos i think just kind of like in general to find out you know if there was already a meeting scheduled that we could just crash you know so that there would automatically be people there you know because the whole point is you know we want to talk to people we don't want to just talk to an empty room we can we do that here most of the time um so, but it would be nice to have a little bit more interaction with the PTOs, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. sounds like a good idea. Awesome, thanks. I have one every once in a while. <laughs> uh, Monique, do you have anything for us from Posok? I don't. Um, there was a meeting early in February, um, and I think what happened was I was absent at the board meeting where I would have discussed that meeting, and unfortunately right. I don't have those notes handy, um, but one of the... Uh, highlights from that meeting is that postdoc is planning or thinking about I think they are, are going to do it commemorating the anniversary of desegregation um, by having a putting together a forum um, and they want to make it an intergenerational uh, forum where it'll be like uh, having students now that have that attend schools have conversations with oh, um, cool former right. Highland Park students who were around at the time of desegregation and you know comparing then and now and um, I thought that was really a cool idea so they're mm -hmm. looking to just kind of do some research and um, get that together they want to have artifacts out in the room so looking at the historical commission um, artifacts that they have and bringing that to the table as well um, and I believe the target is to have that in the early fall um, so that's exciting. Um, and then the other uh, piece, and I wish I had the date on me, I'll have to uh, broadcast that in the next meeting. They are going to uh, coordinate with the Teen Center for another uh, diversity dinner. Awesome. Potluck dinner. So I will have more information on that at the next meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, Anne, anything from the Human Relations Commission? Yes, um, we met, uh, the commission met, I'm sorry, March 20th. Uh, there's nothing specifically school related. Um, but there are a couple of interesting presentations coming up on April 8th. If anybody who is interested should go to the, uh, if, you, if you go to Facebook and search up Highland Park Borough Human Relations Commission, you'll see uh, the Facebook page with events. But there is a presentation on April 8th at 7 p.m. at Borough Hall. Um, it is, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. It's called Lynching Through the Eyes of Artists. It's a presentation by Daniel, Donald Beetham, who is a commission member. Um, it's just what it sounds about. It's, it's about lynching as it was memorialized by artists. It's not necessarily appropriate for younger children, um, but you know, parents can decide that on their own. Um, let's see. Uh, unfortunately, I think we have since missed the other two presentations. But April, April 8th at 7 p.m. is the lynching through the eyes of artists. And there's going, I'm sorry, there's going to be, they're planning, I think it's tentative at this point, a June 19th, Juneteenth cookout on uh, June 19th, if I have that date correct. Um, and I'll present more information about that when I have it. Okay. That'd be for the whole community to come and maybe do some different cultural performances and things. All right. Thank you. Um, Michelle, do you have anything from the Board of Health? Yes. Um, so the Board of Health met in the 14th. And a couple different things. There's a resolution that the council 
is putting forward to our state uh, legislature that would remove the um, religious exemptions for vaccinations so that more children hopefully would be vaccinated. Um, so we had a discussion about that and I had just happened to listen to a really interesting podcast about measles, um, which was eradicated pretty much um, in 2013, but has since come back and it's been in pockets where uh, children are not vaccinated, mainly due to religious exemptions. So. Um, the uh, Board of Health had to give their permission, you know, or, you know, support or not to um, this resolution, and they did support it. Um, everyone there did support it. Also, they talked about the um, Sustainable HP Earth Day coming up, and the uh, focus of Earth Day this year is air quality, being that we have a town that um, has plenty of people driving and plenty of people walking. Um, air quality is an issue that all of us are concerned about and idling came up and I remember we used to get reminders from the kids in the schools about like idling beyond three minutes was uh, against the law and you know so they talked about ticketing um, and it was just it was good to remind everyone of that and so any ideas that anyone has about air quality that we could be discussing um, they would be happy to hear about ideas for Earth Day um, also, they mentioned that there are drop boxes available for um, people that have prescriptions that are outdated or medication that needs to be disposed Is there one of. in town? That's great. There yeah. are actually two. Really? One yes. I so, drove all the way up Ryder's know, Lane because I didn't know there was one in town. I know. For so real? And, and just so happens I went to pick up my prescription at Rite Aid and a little insert was in there with all the paperwork. Who could go through all that? Right? I just You're a saint it, if but, you went through all well, that. I did. So St. <laughs> Michelle saw that there, <laughs> there was a slip of paper in there about Dropbox at Rite Aid and safe drugs. Stop it. <laughs> no questions asked. You just drop it. Yeah. Does this, so, does this include? Where is it? Does this include needles? No. I don't believe it. The one I went equipment. to, all the way up Riders Lane. No, it's not needles. It's no. just prescriptions. But, but they they can have them. When I was attending those meetings, they were discussing needles as well. Okay. Would they, will lead, you don't know that if they didn't come up. We didn't okay. talk about medical equipment of any kind. It was purely prescription drugs. Purely prescription. Right. Yes. Right. So that's great. That's like all parents should know. All really parents great. should yeah, know that. That's yeah, it's a great way to get that stuff out of your house. That's yep. what I was looking to do. Like yep. there was stuff in my house. I needed to get rid of it. Where do you put it? And when I looked it up, nothing in Highland Park came up. Right. So and and that's what the Board of Health was discussing. How to get the word out yeah, about yeah. that. So Rite Aid was on the ball because I literally picked up my prescription a couple days ago and it was in there already. Huh. The little uh, nice. insert. Yeah, so uh, that's good to know. And um, clean out your medicine cabinets. It's spring cleaning time. Also, um, they talked about climate change um, and outreach, wellness, and mental health. Um, and those things took no time at all because it felt like such a massive discussion but it was all lumped into the concept of earth day so they they really are trying very hard to come up with lots of great ideas about getting the word out um through earth day through that one activity one more thing they talked about was fluoridation of our water and currently we are, we are not, not fluoridated, fluoridated but we will be really oh. that is the plan and so they are right now looking, I think what they're doing is um, looking at different providers, <laughs> but as far as the decision to go ahead with that, I think that that is decided. Interesting. Yes. So All right. that is everything that I have from the Board of Health. Well, that's pretty juicy. Yeah. That's not bad, right? <laughs> nice work. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Uh, thank you for that. We don't have Rob here for Green Team. I think Mark has already established that he has nothing from cable TV advisory. I have nothing for a delegate to New Jersey school boards. Next meeting, next delegate assembly is in May. So for the next meeting, I'll find out. Um, I think we've probably missed our, any deadlines or whatever to submit anything. So, um, but I don't know that we have anything pressing right now anyway. 
Um, and Rob's not here for Middlesex County School Boards, although I haven't, I usually pay attention to those emails and I haven't um, seen anything terribly interesting come across. Oh, but which does remind me, one thing you and I talked about in terms of the budget, um, and this isn't a massive line item, but uh, the two of us, I think, discussed it when we were at um, workshop in October, maybe all four of us did. Um, remember, I can't remember who I was with when we talked to somebody, you were definitely there, Rob, when we talked to somebody from the National School Boards, School Boards Association. I was right. there. Right, and then we learned that like we're, Highland Park is one of like very few districts in the state that is part of, you know, a member of the National School Boards Association, and we all kind of went like, oh, well that's interesting. Do we pay for that? Because <laughs> like, as far as I can tell, all we get for that is a bunch of emails that yeah. I, I don't necessarily right. need. And, you know, I mean, I think we all do our part locally and on the state level and i don't know that being a part of the national school boards association gets us much so i think we were all kind of in agreement like there's a few thousand dollars we can save so if that hasn't come out of the budget we'll take that out of the budget and good i read those maybe monthly one a month maybe if it's interesting the one time we were part new jersey was part of the headline it was wrong and I had it's to go back and forth with the woman who sends the emails and say, um, that was wrong. The way you framed that was totally wrong. Right. And then I found out that it's just a subscription, like a service. They right, like right. pour yeah, that it's, out it's to pulling, somebody else. So I'm like, you know, we're good. We don't need right. those emails. It, it's outdated. pulling news and, and that you can get elsewhere. And, it's, know, not, it's not as okay. As passionate as I am about these issues, I'm not about to get right. involved with the National School Boards Association. So I think we're good. Yeah, she was a lovely good. woman. Yeah, a few thousand with. dollars we if can we, save for something else. We shouldn't. Yeah, no, we are. I was like stunned to realize that we're paying for that. So. It does sound really outdated in the, t right. in the age of the internet. Blame this, on. Blame this on. Yeah. Well, there's no. a podcast that's part of it also, I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> supposedly. Again, I'm good. Right. Yeah. I bet it's just as um, good as cereal. Yeah. So, sure. we'll, as we go well, forward, we'll make sure that... We're looking at it uh, on this computer. Yes, it's like twenty seven hundred dollars. I'll take the twenty six hundred and seventy five dollars. Uh, do we? Are, I mean, committed to it? Put it in the kitty. Uh, yeah, I think we're all. Yeah, I think we're all okay with that. Oh yes. Yeah, Unless there's something you think from your perspective that it. I, I don't know anything about it, okay. so I, w I would think first we would want to make sure that we're not losing something that right. we need. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't know. We've never used them for anything that I know of, well, and but all we get are the emails. I, yeah, I, I don't really know. Okay. And uh, I was the interesting part when we uh -huh. talked to her at workshop was like she was like they were actively trying to recruit more boards because yeah. they don't have very many in New Jersey, apparently. So I don't think we're getting some, you know. We should yeah, find some. out we're not using them, and then we should drop it. Huh? We should make sure we're not using some service, yeah. and then we should drop it. Right, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I don't have anything for my president's report this evening. Anybody have anything for old business? Uh, actually, I wanted to tell everyone that this Tuesday, tomorrow, at noon, the TGNC policy committee is going to be meeting up just to revisit the policy and to see, um, you know, if we have any updates that we'd like to make to the policy. Um, but I, talking about that, I really feel very strongly that we should consider presenting again at the board's conference right. in October because there was a tremendously upsetting lack of discussion on any issues the last. having to do with gender. Um, oh, this year. Yeah, it was just, there was nothing. And um, I actually got into a pretty constructive conversation. <laughs> no, I know, right? It's a shock. No, it was, it was a pretty <laughs> constructive conversation with um, two gentlemen who, uh, they just kind of didn't understand the concept. And I was very happy to speak to them you know, uh, in a very personal way. And it was a very collegial, friendly right. conversation. So I, I would love to do it again. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody else have anything for old business? No? New business? No? Sorry. <laughs> Public comment? <laughs> no. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Uh, so moved. Can I get a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody.